the biggest thing for me growing up is I love to make people laugh. You know, I, um, I, I had it, I, I loved animation. You know, I was really into, you know, animated TV shows, um, uh, particularly for whatever reason, Speed Racer. I loved Speed Racer just because I like to get on my big wheel and tear around the neighborhood after I watched an episode of Speed Racer. You know, and of course, Bugs Bunny and Scooby-Doo, um, all the Disney stuff for me growing up. Um, but uh, I love making people laugh and I love performing. And so uh, I remember just being in plays, loving that, um, you know, singing, being in choirs. I, and I particularly loved parody music. Um, if you all are familiar with Weird Al Yankovic, he got his he got his start, you know, right around when I was in high school. And so I would listen to a lot of his stuff and just loved writing parody music. There was a a, a show on um, Sunday night. It was called the Dr. Demento Radio Hour, uh, and it showcased, you know, parody music. And I loved that. So love doing all that. Um, so, yeah, so animation was one of my interests, but more so it was you know, comedy and performing and, and making people laugh. So I was a huge Muppet fan, um, you know, Sesame Street. I grew up on Sesame Street. And so so I that, that was kind of my entryway into animation because, you know, I, I love puppetry. Um, I met Phil Vischer, Bob the Tomato, uh, at college, and he and I would do puppetry together. He was also a huge Jim Henson fan, and we were like serious puppeteers, you know. We would go around it, and so we would write our own um, material and perform, and we would get tons of laughs. Um, and then we found a way as computer technology was advancing, you know, in the mid eighties um, and, you know, uh, and, and beyond, you know, we, we were working in Chicago and video post and uh, we found, you know, we, we started to get more, a little bit more into computer animation and it's like, okay, what if we can combine this technology now with this puppetry in the storytelling that we did you know, in a way that could, you know, bring these characters to life. So, um, so yeah, so it just became for us, animation became a great way to tell the stories that we wanted to tell. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was a video post-production house. That's kind of where I got my start. Uh, Phil was also working there. Um, you know, and, uh, my way into that was, you know, I had volunteered in high school with my, my, my older brother had a band and I ran sound for his band, you know, so I got, you know, to be a sound, you know, kind of learning about sound engineering. Um, I did a, a little bit of that for my church as well. And so, um, uh, you know, so when I, I was in college uh, in, in Chicago, uh, I was doing pre-med. I had no idea I was going to end up in animation. I just kind of did all that stuff for fun. Um, but I was in pre-med and I got this job uh, as a way to pay my way through school. Um, but, you know, sort of that, you know, volunteering to do engineering kind of got me in. And then I started to learn about, you know, more about sound, but also more about editing and shooting um, and, you know, production, and then eventually compositing and graphics and animation. So yeah, that, that first job at Renaissance was my, was my way into the world of production. Yeah. So, um, the name of the, of the, uh, the there was a, uh, if you've all seen, if you're all familiar with the, the eighties band, but dire straits, um, I don't know if any of you are into eighties music, but, uh, dire straits did a, a music video called money for nothing. And it was sort of the anthem of uh, music, music television, MTV at the time. And they did this computer animation. Uh, it's very boxy of this, you know, you can look it up on YouTube, Money for Nothing, Dire Straits video. Uh, and that was that animation was done on an, a Bosch FGS 4000, I guess was the name. It was this huge mainframe computer uh, to do this, you know, animation. And it was really groundbreaking for us. You know, it's like, wow, this, you can put care, you, you can use computers to do character animation. Um, it was still very, you know, very rigid, very boxy. There was none of the, you know, applications of squash and stretch and, you know, kind of the illusion of life that you, you all learn, you know, early on in animation, but you can make things move around. And that was really cool. And so our company bought one of those um, to basically fly logos around. Um, and, you know, uh, Phil very quickly just started to figure out, okay, how do you, how could we use this to, to create characters? And it wasn't until uh, later, and we would go to the, um, there was a, a convention called SIGGRAPH, which was sort of an artists and technology convention that happened every year. And uh, John Lasseter, um, and this was just as Pixar was starting to form, Pixar at this point was just doing short films. John Lasseter, who had been fired from Disney uh, as a, uh, because he was really into computer animation, was trying to push Disney into computer. Um, and they said, nope, you know, we don't need it. And so 
he left Disney and uh, Steve Jobs, who was forming Pixar up in Northern California, picked up John Lasseter and uh, John started to do experimental films, you know, with, um, you know, the new technology that we're developing there as a classically trained animator, he was able to employ those concepts and, and figure out how to do squash and stretch and, you know, make characters kind of, you know, feel like characters. And so, you know, we would, we would see this at SIGGRAPH, they display these films like Luxor Jr. and, and um, you know, uh, Rhett's Dream and all these, and we, we, it was just amazing. And then uh, a, a software package called Softimage came out about that time, which allowed you to do you know, something called lattice de deformation. And if, you, if you've all had, you know, uh, see any CG uh, animation classes, you're probably familiar with that term. And, you know, it, this is way before inter inverse kinematics and all that kind of stuff. But you basically, you know, you, you would, you know, take a, you'd take a, you'd, you'd model a rigid object like a cup and you'd build a lattice around it. Um, and then you would just stretch the points of the lattice and it would, it would stretch that what was contained in the lattice. And so, you know, you could do squash and stretch and you could make things hop around. And, um, you know, so all of that, you know, software became available, you know, and, and, you know, we were able to use it through the course of work, but then realize, okay, I think the real value in this is not going to be flying logos around the real value in this is going to be creating characters and telling stories. Yeah, so we were uh, right by a comic book store. So yeah, so uh, Phil and I were working for a video post house. It was, you know, we had left Renaissance and we were working for a place called Film and Tape Works. And um, uh, we, had, uh, we had met somebody through that company who was willing to, it was a client of the company uh, who was willing to put up the money to buy uh, a Silicon Graphics workstation, which at the time was like the biggest thing you know, um, you know, kind of a, you know, it was a computer that would house the software software that we could, we could make this, you know, show on. And so, um, so uh, in exchange for the international rights to whatever show we created, you know, so, so we got this piece of, we've got this equipment, Phil started using it in his spare bedroom of his house, you know, to start animating the first show. And, um, uh, that he, that just became, we, it became too much just to, you know, have people coming in and out of his house. And so, uh, we rented this office space, uh, on Foster Avenue in Chicago, and it was right next to a comic book store. And we actually shared the same thermostat you know, but the thermostat was on their side, you know, so when they went home, and it got cold at night on Chicago winter, you know, we'd freeze, <laughs> we'd freeze as we were working all nighters, you know, on on the show on, on our side of the on our side of the, you know, kind of the divide. So yeah, it was it was it was crazy times. We were Yeah, we were right there next to a comic book store. Uh, so the crazy thing was even data storage, you know, was was just so hard, because we had I forget, like the, the hard drive on the computer that we had was very small. And you know, there were there, you couldn't just go out and buy a, you know, a USB drive, you know, so dr drives were very expensive. And we actually had to back up on tape on data tape, you know, and so and even the process of, of rendering frame by frame was was crazy, because it was all you'd had, to, you had to do it by data entry, you know, just like, you know, render this frame, and then it would roll off render this frame. And so we, we even had to figure out, okay, what software could we use now to be able to um, you know, take, take these frames and assemble them into 30 frames a second, you know, which, cause we were still doing kind of video rate at that time, not 24, which was film, which is film rate. How do we get these 30 frames a second to, you know, lay down to, uh, tape because we weren't, uh, or, or even, you know, even, you know, nonlinear editing, how do we, how do we do that? So, so all of that stuff was just painstaking, you know, stuff that we really take for granted and is so automatic. Now we had to figure that out. So I had to, I had to figure out how to write code um, in Unix to be able to, you know, render, you know, stuff frame by frame out to a, you know, videotape machine. And, uh, you know, all I had, I had a little bit of basic computer programming before that, but not a lot, you know, so it was just, you know, it was just, crazy amount of work trying to figure out and a lot of hours, you know, we started the, we started animating in early 2000, or early 1993, you know, and then, you know, finished up just before Christmas of 1993. But it was a, an incredible amount of work to try to figure all that out. Because you're right, this was pre Toy Story. Um, you know, a lot of the software packages that are out now uh, just were not available to us back then. Right. right, right. One of the things that we did, um, of course, we didn't have distribution, um, you know, because we were, you know, we were just a couple of goofy guys in Chicago, like, you know, what are, you know, who, who you know, who's going to give us a, a distribution deal. And so we, we bought 
ad space in, in some parenting magazines um, to sell our VHS tapes, you know, and, and, you know, kind of the, the other kind of cool thing about uh, the, the period in time when, when this happened was it was sort of this home video revolution, you know, up until that point, if you wanted to see something, you know, if you wanted to see a TV show, if you wanted to see a movie, you had to go to the theater or you had to wait for it to be on TV. There was no such thing as, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get this show and play it whenever I want. That was a brand new thing. And so that was the other kind of the business opportunity that we saw. It's like, okay, we feel like there's a really big opportunity here to make a show that's going to be valuable for parents, particularly parents of faith who want to pass on these values to their kids in a really fun and entertaining way. And we thought, well, if we can, if we can make this, put it on a VHS tape, then people are going to want it. And so, so we, you know, we took out ads and in, in some parenting magazines, we got about 500 orders for our very first show. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it seems like, you know, very little money these days. Um, but, you know, back then it was so much money to, to produce our first show was we put about $60,000 into making our first show. Um, and we got about 500 orders at $15 a piece. So if you do the math, you know, that doesn't come close to equaling $60,000. But one of those orders came from um, a, uh, a distributor in Nashville, actually, they were a record label who were, they were starting a home, a children's home video uh, uh, stamp. And, you know, they saw our ad and were intrigued. They ordered one, they loved it. And then, uh, you know, uh, within the next few months we, after our release, we were signed up for a, a distribution deal. And, uh, you know, what's so cool about it, if you go back and watch our early shows, they're yeah. pretty rough, you know, uh, artistically and tech technically. Um, but one of the things that we really wanted to do was, you know, we needed simple characters because, you know, computer animation was so limited at the time. We needed characters with no limbs and no hair and no clothes, because uh, all those things were really hard to do. Uh, but, you know, we sort of found these goofy, you know, the, the idea of these vegetables telling stories was just kind of goofy in and of itself. Uh, but then over time, as the technology advanced, as we were able to hire, you know, better artists, you know, better animators, um, we were able to make the most of those, those simple characters. And so by the time we did Jonah, and then later the pirates didn't do anything, uh, you know, artistically, you know, they weren't, they weren't at the level of a $150 million Pixar film, you know, but they worked for what they were, you know, yeah. so, uh, and they had their own charm. Um, so it's, you know, you can do a lot with a little, you know, if you're, if, if, you know, you put the parts together correctly. A lot of our initial first voices came from puppets that we performed, you know, so um, Larry, I did a, a puppet called Soupy and his voice was kind of low and dopey and he had a lisp, you know, it's kind of like that, which is the very first Larry voice. So if, it, you know, so any of those first two or three shows, that's the voice that Larry had. Um, but I found as I was performing that voice, it was just hard to get a lot of energy out of that. And I felt like the character who I wanted Larry to be was just going to be more, you know, kind of more bubbly and, you know, more energetic. And so, you know, I started to kind of take his voice up and then over time lost the lisp. I think probably around the time of, I don't know, show 11 or 12, you know, it's like, why, why am I doing a lisp with this? You know, it's like, I'm going to lose the lisp. And so, you know, so, uh, you know, so Larry kind of went through reverse puberty, you know, as he, as his voice got higher instead of lower and, uh, you know, and he started, and he ended up like this. So this is what his voice is like, you know? So, so even in the early days, um, well, after, after the voice went up, it kind of went up and Phil had a lift, Phil like lift. So, you know, then I lost the lift. So anyway, so that's kind of how that voice evolved. And, and it was really, um, you know, just based on the personality, Phil, Phil and I based the Bob and Larry personalities after kind of our, fr our own friendship and how we interacted. And so I just wanted to have, you know, that, that higher energy and that, you know, kind of more goofy, affable, uh, voice worked better for Larry. So, um, and it became a really comfortable place for me to perform in over the years. Yeah. So, um, Jean Claude, uh, you know, that was, a, if you all are familiar with Monty Python, um, you know, and uh, the Holy Grail, you know, the, the peas, when we first brought out the peas for, uh, I think, Dave and the Giant Pickle, um, you know, they were kind of the, the, the idea with those peas was they were, you know, the, those, the mocking Frenchmen, you know, on the wall, you know, just mocking, uh, mocking the Israelites. And so, um, so I don't know, I've, Jean-Claude has always been that just sometimes this screaming pea, you know, so just really gruff voice and the French accent and just screaming out. Um, so I, that, that's how I started with Jean-Claude and he just kind of stayed like that. Cause it just, 
fit, you know, kind of his brash personality. Um, but, uh, and it's a, it's a hard voice to do whenever I do, because it's so gravelly and so screamy. Yeah. If I'm ever recording with Jean-Claude, I, I leave him for the end of the, the recording day. So, um, cause my voice is pretty much toast after that. And then, um, Jerry Gord's voice came about Phil and I, uh, when we were working in the video post world at a place called film and tape works, we both had a, we had a boss. His name was Jim Mahoney. Uh, and, um, Jimmy and Jerry, Gord were our both of our imitations of of our boss Jim, you know. So, so you know, Jerry, Jerry, Gord kind of sounded like Jim when he talked, and so that's kind of how I I I would you know make fun of Jim and then uh, you know of our boss, and then Phil would do his voice as Jerry. So that that was sort of the origin of those two voices. Yeah, yeah. So I I'm not a I, I'm not a musician. I'm not a trained yeah. trained musician, uh, but I love music. I've always written lyrics. You know, I mentioned that I love parody music, and so. Um, so I really got into that, you know, that whole thing. And, um, you know, I just kind of found like for me, uh, and I think, you know, and later I would actually study more of the creative process, you know, but I, you know, I, I'm a college professor. I actually teach, you know, film and animation oh, yeah, at yeah. Lipscomb University in, in Nashville. And I, I teach a class called Career Creativity. And I think the essence of, of creativity is combining things in new ways, you know? So, so you go out in the world, you notice some things, and then, you know, you, you combine this thing with this thing, with this thing, and you create something new. Um, and, you know, and, you know, that, that hasn't, nobody's seen before, and it, it has value that way. Um, and so, and I think that's what a lot of what Silly Songs was, I would, I would take things that I noticed, and sort of, you know, combine them, um, you know, and I think part of the, part of the humor that I love, I love the subtext of the humor where you're, you're, you're maybe singing about one thing, but the subtext means another thing, you know, so you kind of have that, you know, so it's not silliness just for the sake of being silly, you know, there's something else to it, you know, like, um, you know, like, you know, even with the hairbrush song, which is the first song that I wrote, you know, it's just like, okay, where's it? It's a, it's a, you know, cucumber looking for his, his hairbrush, but yet he's bald, you know, and there's people, you know, you know, who can relate to that because they're bald and they don't have any hair, um, uh, you know, and then we combined it with this kind of melodramatic opera. And, you know, so it just turned into this goofy thing that maybe, you know, had a little bit more meaning to it. And, you know, or the cheeseburger song where he's singing about his cheeseburger, but it's almost like, you know, you'd, uh, the same thing you'd hear from a love song. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, just is just fun to combine these elements, uh, these maybe, you know, different elements and and you know like the poster that i have behind me from the dance of the cucumber my wife is colombian um and she, she's native spanish speaking and uh uh she was i was riding driving in the car with her one day and she had on a cassette tape of uh you know the song called los americanos which was um which means the americans and it was making fun of americans uh just kind of their you know traditions and their mannerisms and all that sort of thing and she was she was um translating that for me I say like, oh what are, you know what what is he singing so she was translating that to me basically making fun of me as she's translating for me and I just love that dynamic I thought that would be super funny and so I just took that dynamic and it's like, okay what if Larry is singing a song in Spanish you know about you know how Bob can't dance or whistle or sing you know and Bob is forced to translate that for the audience so that was just a really fun dynamic so yeah so just taking stuff like that from real life and and you know kind of you know combining it in a different way uh, to make something fun. Oh yeah, no, that was me. I was so, okay. So uh, in the early days uh, of the, of the show, you know, we weren't making a lot of money even after we had a record deal or, or, or a distribution deal. Um, and so I had to take on a lot of freelance work, you know, so we'd get, we'd get, you know, we get in advance barely enough to make the budget, but we were paying employees and, and sometimes there wasn't money left over. So I would have to take this freelance work, um, you know, to, to make ends meet. Well, the thing about working freelance is you have to pay your own taxes. And so, you know, uh, I, I'd make this money. And then at the end of the year, I would do my, my taxes. And then I would, I would owe, you know, thousands of dollars. Um, and, you know, it, and it would just make me mad. It's like, oh, I have to give this money away now. And so, so I was working on that song, right? It was probably, you know, in March or April, right around tax time. And I just, the irony of a, you know, a Viking uh, and a robber coming and, and Santa sharing his cookies with them, but then the IRS guy coming and, you know, that was just too much, you know? So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that, that was me just being mad that I owed money on taxes that year. Yeah. So, you know, we really wanted to, um, 
create episodes for, you know, four-year-olds in terms yeah. of lessons um, and just say, okay, what, what, what lessons are, are going to be good for a four-year-old, four or five-year-old to learn, um, you know, stuff about life, uh, you know, kind of from the perspective of a, of a world, uh, of a biblical worldview, you know, kind of under the assumption that there's a God who made us, who loves us, who wants a relationship with us. Um, you know, this is why we should, you know, be thankful. This is, you know, why we should share. This is why we should tell the truth. You know, those types of lessons boiled down um, into language that a four-year-old can comprehend. Yeah. And a lot of times mixed with the song, um, you know, to make that memorable in music. And so, um, so that, that was the, the, that was the, the goal with the, the lessons themselves and the story, and then building a story around that theme um, where, you know, it just, if you've all had story classes or story structure class, just the idea that you have a, you know, you have a hero who, who, you know, wants something, they're after a goal, they come up against conflict and they have to overcome that conflict to, to get that goal and learn a lesson, you know, in the context. Um, so just, you know, that, that type of, you know, basic storytelling to tell these, to tell these stories, but then the humor, we kind of, um, you know, we wanted to make ourselves laugh. And so, you know, we'd put stuff in there that kids wouldn't get um, and hopefully that, you know, hopefully they would one day when they were older, but, you know, I remember growing up on Bugs Bunny and, you know, uh, just loving Bugs Bunny, but then getting older and watching Bugs Bunny. And there's like a whole nother level of humor was there. I was like, oh my gosh, I can enjoy this as an adult too. And so, you know, that was, you know, what, what we aim to do with VeggieTales on that level of humor and, and entertainment. But at the, at the core of it was, yeah, we wanted to, we wanted to boil down lessons that were simple and easy for kids to digest. And then of course the, the overall message of VeggieTales, you know, uh, at the end of the show was always remember, got, always remember God made you special and he loves you very much. You know, so that would be what we'd sign off with all the time. But you know, uh, those, those other kind of core value lessons is what we wanted to get across to kids. I, yeah, I love that because yeah, we, we had, would have fans from all different, you know, denominations and all different faiths just saying, Hey, we just, we love the storytelling. We love the messages and, you know, um, and you know, that's great. And I think, I think when you tell a story, I, I think that's the biggest thing that you, you know, as a storyteller, you need to concentrate on is just, telling a story that's true, you know, emotionally true. And if you're, if you're going to be, if you're going to be teaching a lesson, that lesson, you, you need to bring your character through an arc um, and, and through that story in a way that when you get to the end and they learn that lesson, it needs to be, it needs to feel emotionally true. Um, and if you, if that's, if that's right, then you've done your, you've done your job well as a storyteller um, and, you know, people feel it and they, they're entertained and, you know, they don't roll their eyes at it. Um, and, you know, and it, it's, it's probably the hardest thing to do. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not an easy task, but, um, you know, at, at at the end of the day, I think if you can tell a good story, um, you can engage an audience, you know, regardless of what the theme is. Yeah, yeah, we did the rumor weed. Uh, and then also um, uh, Esther, the, the story of Esther, we made that much more cinematic, you know, just yeah. because we we're kind of leaning up to, okay, could we do this as a movie? Um, so Larry Boy definitely had elements of that. Esther did kind of more, you know, cinematic elements. Um, and, and frankly, when we started writing Jonah, Jonah initially was going to be a, a home video release. Um, but as we were writing it, it just, the story just kept getting bigger. And, you know, we thought, you know, this is working great. You know, you know, maybe we should make our, this should be our first film. So, um, so we didn't start out with, you yeah. know, the idea from the beginning that Jonah would be our, our first movie. It sort of evolved from, you know, kind of intending it to be a home video release. But yeah, we, we were definitely on that trajectory, trying to get more complex, longer stories, more complex visuals, more cinematic, uh, you know, compositions, you know, just to be able to be able to have a story hold up on the big screen. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the first and, and hardest thing was, you know, working on the story to get the story to work for that long, because, you know, the, the longer your story is, um, the more engaging your theme and your characters need to be, you know, to get the audience to buy into that you know that story for that long so if you're gonna if you're gonna be doing a five minute film you know you know it can be funny here you can do this here do this here uh you know and you can get away with a lot in five minutes but if you stretch that out over 70 minutes you you have to engage your your you know your audience in the character in the story in the world uh and so um so that was the that was the the, the first big challenge is making sure um you know that the script was was right. And even through storyboarding, and you all know, you know, as animators, 
storyboarding is kind of part of writing, you know, so you, you write it, you storyboard it, you put it up on reels, you see what works, what doesn't, and you rewrite, then you restoryboard, you know, until everything gets, you know, nailed down and then you start production. And even then, you know, we ended up, uh, as we were in act three, I remember we ended up having to redo a lot of act three. Um, but you know, so that, you know, long, the longer, the, the longer the story, the, the, the more intricate and, um, detailed the structuring of the story needs to be so you can basically so so your audience can connect with that character for that amount of time so that was the first thing and then the other thing was just the visuals they needed to be you know more elaborate you know more interesting to look at for that long you know not quite so simplistic um, and uh, and just have more you know cinematic compositions um, and so you know the the ship that we used was you know, more complex than we had, you know, was a more complex model than we had seen before. And I remember, you know, when we, that was first modeled, our, our, our modelers really made it so intricate that it was too heavy when they brought the files in loaded up, oh, it would wow. just bog down the computer. So we had to thin it out and all that kind of stuff and figure out, we only need to build what we're going to see on the screen. You know, you don't have to build stuff below deck that you're never going to see all that kind of stuff. So, but um, yeah, just kind of assembling that, that, you know, visual world and making that more complex was also, you know, a big deal when, when making a film. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, you're dealing with, you know, and again, computers now are just and, and the software available now is just so much more robust, but the fluid dynamics of the movement of water and then studying, okay, you know, this is how water moves, but it also has a certain translucency to it. You know, it's not solid, you know, but it's not completely transparent. There's a, there's a translucency that you need to get right. Ocean water has a foam element to it when it rolls that if you don't have the, the foam right, it doesn't look like, you know, it doesn't look believable. So we wanted to be stylistic with the water, you know, have it look cartoony, not super realistic, but still feel like, okay, this is ocean water. So that, that took a while to, you know, to get it right for that world, you know? So that's the other thing, you know, when you're, when you're creating a, a stylistic world, uh, you know, things have to fit stylistically within that world. So, you, you know, you can't have super realistic water, you know, you know, in a, in a world that, you know, other things aren't super realistic, you know, that kind of thing, but it still needed to feel like water. So yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned water. Cause that was a really tough thing to tackle in that movie, but yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, and you know, endangered love, I've got um, the Barbara manatee uh, from endangered love uh, carved out of solid Oak right here. Here, let me show you this. This is really fun. One of our uh, one of our animators, his dad was a chainsaw artist, and uh, and Jeremy ended up actually ended up going to Pixar. And oh, when no. he left, big idea, he uh, he gave me you know his barber manatee that his dad had carved out of solid oak. So it's one of my one of my prized possessions. <laughs> so, That's great. That looks awesome. With with the, with the chainsaw, it's super heavy too. Obviously, um, you know get as much of your school experience uh, as you can. Um, don't wait to graduate before you start creating. Um, you know, I think it's important to start working on stories, working on your films now while you're in school. You know, I'm sure you do some of that for your assignments, but the more you can do, the more you can create now and, you know, creating a great portfolio um, will just give you, you know, more of a leg up when you get out into the industry. And then, yeah. And then just look for opportunities to get your foot in the door. It may not be at a big studio, but it, you know, maybe at an advertising firm, um, you know, just, you know, starting off, you know, doing simple stuff, but, you know, eventually, you know, you'll, you'll get those, those bigger and better opportunities. You know, we, we, you know, at big idea, we were, we were that small studio, you know, we, we would hire students coming out of, um, you know, Columbia college in Chicago, uh, out of their animation program. And, you know, they, they cut their teeth on, you know, doing this goofy little vegetable animation in Chicago. And then, you know, a lot of them went on to work for Blue Sky and Pixar and Sony, you know, so, um, you know, that it may not be, it may not be the dream job right away, but, you know, just, you know, get that, you know, build up your portfolio, take advantage of, you know, what you can get along the way and then, you know, build from there. You know, I'll leave, you know, letting you all know about Dead Sea Squirrels, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're in production of that and, uh, you know, be on the lookout for um, that on a streaming service uh, pretty soon. But um, uh, we've been having a great time making it. And uh, I think it should be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, it's fun to it's fun to keep creating, you know, and that that's the thing. I mean, this has been, um, you know, life in the arts is is uh, it, it can be challenging and tough at times. But 
uh, you're doing what you love and it can be so worth it. Um, and so, you know, just, just stick with it and, you know, keep with your passion and, uh, you know, find, find a way to find a way to make it work. Cause it's, it's a great life. If you can, uh, if you can make a go at it, I'll sign off as Larry. See y'all later. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>